Uh, my name is John. I'm with Foundation Brewing Company, and I love beer. I'm Chris from Barrel Souls, and I brew beer. Hi, I'm Jake Austin from Austin Street Brewery, and I love beer. My name's Nathan Sanborn. I'm the owner of Rising Tide Brewing Company, and I sure do love beer. My name is Don Littlefield. I'm the general manager of the Main Brew Bus. We've been driving you to drink local since 2012, and I love beer. I'm Matthew Brown, and I'm a proud Portland, Maine home brewer. When you talk about Maine as a state, what comes to mind? Beautiful landscapes and rocky coastlines, perhaps. Maybe world-class seafood, quieter living, and hearty people. In the last five years, a new facet of Maine life has gained notoriety and significance. Maine, with Portland as the epicenter, has become an incubator for an emerging beer brewing industry that has forced outsiders to sit up and take notice. Beer's economic impact to the state now rivals lobster as the state's most predominant contributor to state GDP. But why? Why has beer gained such a foothold here? Why has the community wrapped its collective arms around this industry and allowed it to flourish? To learn more, I interviewed heads of breweries, a beer bus tour guide, and a home brewer. Our goal as enthusiasts is to better understand this from the ground up, to understand what obstacles lay ahead for expansion, and what are consumers clamoring for from our breweries. It's possible the catalyst for the growth in this beer industry originated with the main law change back in 2011. Yeah, well, I think largely um, what has allowed for the sudden rapid growth is um, the uh, change of, in, in state law that has allowed breweries to have uh, tasting room on premise. Okay. Um, prior to, well, even when I started, um, I was not allowed to sell beer out the front door. I was, well, I was allowed to sell packaged beer out the front sure, door. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but I was not allowed to sell beer to consume on premise. I could only give away a sample in conjunction with a tour of our facility. I sort of allowed for smaller operations to open up where um, they don't necessarily have to have um, packaging capability. They can sell all their beer out the front door potentially, or, or the majority of it. And um, you know, and get those larger margins. So you need to make less beer. Um, the first and I think most important thing was when the tasting room law changed in 2011. And what that did is that let breweries uh, sell beer directly to customers without operating as a bar. Correct. Okay. And um, so what that did was um, it it really allows a brewery to open and have a fairly reliable income stream from day one as a business. The tasting room law um, allowed people basically cash flow from early on, which as a startup business very, very is integral. very <laughs> integral to um, keeping the lights on. Yep. Uh, and, and it gives you more control over that. Um, but then the other piece is, so I think that's where, you know, when you say well, there's 130 breweries in Maine, a lot of this comes from the ability to, to do that, to sell beer directly to your, to your customers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then they can support the brewery directly. And that makes the initial stages work. I think what we've seen here in Portland is a, a genuine uptick in interest. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, word of mouth. As more breweries grow and more people get excited about them, they pass the word on to their family and friends. I think the media has played a, a big part. Every time we're named on a list of a great place to eat, drink, live, breathe, sleep, mm -hmm. that helps add to the, uh, the component of people that are coming here. Uh, listen, Portland and Maine has always been a destination for vacationers, for leisure travelers. It's been named, uh, nicknamed Vacation Land since uh, the 1910s. Mm -hmm. um, and I think more and more people are coming here to not only uh, see the natural wonders that we have of the rocky coast and the lighthouses and the boats, but also to enjoy the great food and drink we have here. Um, and the main beer scene is a key part of that. Uh, as more brewers have become uh, interested in taking their uh, homebrew passions to a commercial level, uh, they've done so in a very competitive market and they've been able to, in most cases, excel uh, and not just be part of the crowd but really differentiate themselves as best they can. Maine's uh, brew scene is just blown up. I think that we thought that we were maybe late to the game when we opened four plus years ago. That's literally why we ended up in Saco because we just felt like we had to get open. Because in the meantime, while we were looking at property, Bissell had opened, Foundation had opened, Austin Street had opened, Banded 
pouring out Bandit Brewing. Yep. Head opened and we're like, oh crap, are there gonna be too many breweries in Maine? People are coming, especially to Maine, right now on vacation and trying to hit as many breweries as they are, can. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they come here for our brewery and experience three or four new ones in the area. Or maybe they come here for Bissell and stop at us on the way back and had never heard of us kind of thing. But they came here for a specific brewery or maybe for a couple. But they check out the other breweries in the area while they're here, um, which I think has been a huge boost to Maine beer and Maine tourism as a whole. I think beer is bringing a lot of people to Maine all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. The thing for us in Maine, at least, is the quality of beer. Not just like the number of breweries necessarily, but people know when they come here, yeah, we have a certain number of breweries, but they're like very worthwhile to hit. They're not just like, oh, one great brewery and a bunch of filler. Right. It's like a bunch of outstanding breweries that you can build a whole like vacation or a whole weekend or whatever out of. The competition honestly brings yeah. out the best in us for sure. And I think, yeah, there seems to be an extra focus on quality. Uh, but not just quality, but just like also what people want to drink and, you know, we're just tailoring it to what people want, but also making it high quality as well. But I think collaboration wise, I think it's a great environment. And I think the difference is that, say, you, if you came to Maine, you could only visit one brewery, then it'd be a different story. But the fact that people do come to Maine to visit multiple breweries makes it like a, that makes it that type of environment. And that gets us all in the same neighborhood in it. Cause we, we're counting on someone coming here. It's not like filling your gas tank when you come to Maine, you're gonna might fill your tank once in one gas station, but you're gonna come breweries, you go all these different breweries. So it, it allows us sort of kind of have, have that sort of vibe going on, I feel like. That's true. People come here on vacation. Vacation is experiential. Eating and drinking is experiential. Mm -hmm. Coming to a brewery and seeing what's going on and how it's going on in the scene is experiential. And so for us, um, like I said, we're very product based. We're very like, we want to be able to make killer, fantastic beer that sure. you can put in a bottle and take a label off and have someone drink and they go, that's good. That's good. I like that. um, but we also operate in a world where people are here because they are looking for an experience. They're looking for um, part of their, their vacation. That's why the tasting rooms are so popular. What we discovered early into each conversation was how much the community aspect of this industry played a big part in helping not just get started, but acting as the tie that has propelled each to a higher level of success collectively. Yeah, I'm lucky because we have operations in three different uh, cities in New England that I'm able to see some of those differentiating, uh, differentiating points yep. or different points. Um, you know, we can actually demonstrate in Portland uh, with four different buildings that house multiple fermentation businesses under one roof. And in some cases, it's uh, more than just beer. Sometimes it's wine and spirits as well. And so that would be most notably one industrial way, mm -hmm. Thompson's Point. Um, also, the building uh, on 219 Anderson Street, where Lone Pine and Good Fire exist with two other wineries. And then certainly the building that houses Oxbow Blending and Bottling with Maine Mead Works and, and also Hardshore. Hardshore just still in. Mm -hmm. Those mean that th those are neighbors so they're doing either competitive, uh, could be competitive or, or different, um, definitely in the style of creating craft alcohol and they, they definitely support each other uh, with those common walls. Take those walls away and you've got a community of, of brewers that are very eager to help out each other. We had a lot of help opening from just help with paperwork to uh, using Bissell Brothers keg washer for a period of time, using their equipment, and then you know we've tried to pay it forward as much as possible, helping other breweries as they open. Sure. We've washed a couple of different breweries kegs for them as they open, and that seems, keg washer seems to be kind of like a forgotten or like last thought. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that sort of collaboration there is there for sure. Maybe not so much on the recipe side unless you're actually collaborating on a beer, um, but it seems to be a very good environment. Probably the the easiest thing to kind of. Uh, to, to start with, from my experience, ha has always been uh, the willing nature of others to help people get into the art or the craft. Um, so for me, I had uh, a really wonderful colleague, a friend of mine that I'd known, uh, that was hands down, still, still considered one of the more venerated individuals in the, in the area. The thing that really surprised me was you know, I had always understood that there's almost like a caste system where you have home brewers, but then above them were pro brewers, and they don't really talk to each other because of, you know, for whatever reasons, maybe some people look down their noses at us or, you know, because we finally crossed the line and you guys haven't. 
Um, but I've never felt that here in Portland. I always felt that there was a very much an open and honest collaboration between you know, people who prefer to do it in their basements or in their backyards or you know, what, what have you um, versus people that you know, obviously do it for a living. Um, but I've had so many instances doing this where they have reached out uh, with you know, assistance and thought process um, some raw materials, um, knowledge and know-how, and it's been enormously helpful. Um, I think that's that's just part of the spirit of collaboration that is rife in the in the industry, especially here in the area. The community is fantastic. You know, when I, I moved, uh, first opened my brewery, it was over near Allagash, and you know those guys could not be more uh, welcoming yeah. of. Um, you know, of other brewers. Uh, you know, uh, the brewery name, Rising Tide, certainly speaks to that, uh, you know, sure. Rising Tide lifts all boats, and uh, I think that's true. I still think that's true. Yeah. Uh, even as, you know, you say, we go from when I started 39 breweries eight years ago to now to 139 all of the breweries, breweries uh, and 60 of those in the past two years. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's all for the all for the good of the community, and you know, the more we are sort of working, pulling together, sure. um, you know, the better off we all are. <laughs> it's an amazing community. I think that yeah, I think that probably every brewery in Maine, if we didn't have that community with each other, would have missed or lost a couple batches of beer over the year because they would have not had something that somebody else came through. Like we, we yeah. travel around a lot, and we do a lot of collaborations with breweries around the country. Um, and I've heard from other other places, not to like name names or yeah, anything, yeah, but like places where they've they look at our like collaborative sort of nature in Maine and are very envious of it and kind of wish that they could have that sort of thing in other states. Right. Even the, the Brewers Guild too is something that a lot of people look at the Maine Brewers Guild as, as something that like they kind of strive to like have that in their own state. Really? Kind of look up at it as like a, an example and that's just another example of how everyone's come together really well. Maine definitely has something special. There's a, a quality control lab that came up out of USM through breweries collaborating sure. together and through saying let's let's work together to make sure everyone is bringing out the the best quality product that they can and there's there's a definite benefit to all of us so when people vacation in Maine they come to Maine knowing you get to experience a ton mm -hmm. of high quality world class breweries all right here and we're all lifting each other up so what exactly is the current trend in terms of what consumers demand for the most at this time? I think the, the double IPA craze is, is here to stay at least for a long period of time. I mean, that's definitely, I think half the beer community probably drinks nothing but IPAs. So we focus, we really like focus on this kind of stuff, like barrel aged beers, big beers, imperial stouts, barley wines, wheat wines. Sure. Um, that sit in the barrel for a long time, high ABV stuff. That's just kind of kind of unique to what we do. It's what Matt and I, it's like our favorite kind of beer. I mean, I think it's an exciting time to be brewing because people are very receptive to things that six, seven years ago, people would have snubbed their nose at or, or scratched their head and walked away. I think you always see some change in palates and you know, it depends a little bit on who your, uh, who your target uh, which segment of the audience you're talking about, right? Sure. I mean, there's certain, um, you know, a certain segment that's very much moved into sort of the New England IPA sort of realm, hazy, um, softer mouthfeel, sure. lower bitterness, really fruit forward. Um, but that's not the whole of the market. That's just a piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so we still see, even for us, we see, you know, really strong growth in, um, you know, even in our copper ale. Which is not hoppy, no. not sexy in that <laughs> regard, but people love it. It's a great, easy drinking beer. Sure. It's sometimes just a nice thing to, to reach for. People have been predicting the death of the IPA for a decade, and they're wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. There's a shift in that, though. There There's is. some really interesting exploration and science so, behind it. So I think I think people need to get past the name IPA, stands for India Pale Ale, mm -hmm. and really should mean more a beer driven by hop flavor, however that's derived. IPA is going to outsell most anything else you make significantly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the most popular style. And there are breweries that are gonna be exceptions to that rule. But um, you look at 
the vast majority and sort of even out the edges, that's going to be the general trend. And um, because it's what, it's what the American beer drinker likes. Uh, I mean, you, you said it, it's hot forward beers for sure. Uh, we definitely brew more IPAs, I think, than we ever thought we would brew. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when we first started four and a half years ago, I thought we would have like an IPA, a double IPA, etc. We have multiple IPAs, we now have multiple double IPAs. And we love brewing those for sure, so we're not we're okay with that. But yeah, we're brewing more hot forward beers than we ever thought we would. And trying to strike that balance, I guess, like you said, we do have six grain on our milk stout, mm -hmm. which is very popular and we're very proud of. But trying to balance the portfolio of like pleasing that hot forward crowd but also staying true to what we want to do is definitely been interesting. I, I, I would say that there's a couple of clear categories. This is by no means all of the categories, but the category sure. is I like IPAs, the hoppier the better. And right. definitely people are seeking that with a category created called New England IPA. Uh, they want to come here to, to experience that. Sure. There's another category of people which are anti-IPA. I don't like those hoppy <laughs> beers, but I don't mind a stout or a sour, and I find those two kind of sometimes in the same category, hmm. and they're you know they're diamet diametrically different from each other, sure. but it's really interesting, uh, and sometimes it's the wine lovers that really can get behind a sour. There's right. some you know there's some aspects of sour beer that is familiar to them. Correct. Um, and then uh, the, our favorite are the equal opportunity, uh, continuous education type people like I'll take anything, and I just want to support this this movement, uh, and they're the ones you know that will buy. Uh, a really unique Schwartz beer, uh, as well as a more popular IPA. There's something about brewers and breweries that is truly disarming. People in the beer community are professionals, but also incredibly personal and have an inherent love in sharing their craft. They're industrious, affable, and willing to share. This has led to such collaboration and cross-pollinating between breweries that they exude a sense of true community rather than competition. They offer their resources, time, and expertise at request, and don't only seem to serve the community with their product, but the general industry with goodwill. Indeed, rising tides do lift all boats. And as for the palate of the consumers, things like the IPA are here to stay, and that could be excellent for the local hop purveyors in the state as a correlated industry, but finding the next big idea in the brewing world is always the lurking specter. Do we return to malty, rich ales and lagers? Or perhaps the sour craze will accelerate? Either way, we'll be around to try them. <laughs>